My name is Hussein Simitchi, and together with Cheng, we'll talk about uh, how, we we'll do, how we do erasure coding in Microsoft's Windows Azure storage. Uh, this work uh, has been done in collaboration with our colleagues in Microsoft, Hikeng, Aaron, Brad, Parakshit, Jean, and Sergey. And before starting, I would like to thank the program committee for the award. Um, in the first part of the talk, which I will present, um, I'll talk about a brief uh, introduction on Windows Azure Storage and, and, and how, we do, how we use the conventional established erasure codes in Windows Azure Storage. In the, in the second, more interesting part of the talk, Cheng will talk about how we improve the standard erasure coding. Um, Windows Azure Storage, as you see in the, in the map, is a totally global scale storage system. Uh, it is uh, distributed uh, across three geographical regions. Each geographical region is further subdivided into subregions, uh, and the subregions represent major data centers. Uh, and the data in subregions are geo-replicated to other subregions. For example, uh, the data in Northern Europe data centers are rep replicated to the, to the data centers in the Western Europe. Uh, in addition to the major data centers, we have a lot of uh, content distribution network points of presence uh, locations, uh, which are used for proximity caching. <clears throat> uh, at, the, at the user level, Windows Azure Storage provides several abstractions for storage. Uh, the most uh, uh, important ones are blob storage, which provides the, uh, the file store in the cloud. And then we have CDN, which provides proximity caching. There are uh, Azure drives, which provides NTFS volumes for virtual machines. Uh, there's tables, which provides a structured uh, NoSQL uh, storage. And there are queues, which provide reliable messaging. Uh, for applications running in the cloud. Uh, all of these services can be accessed using HTTP REST APIs and, and other client libraries you provide in several programming languages. Uh, so we're talking about the massive scale here. So when you have that many devices, failures and unavailability are unavailable. unavoidable. So uh, to summarize the mean time to failure formula over there, we can say if you have 100 devices, you are 100 times more likely to have a failure compared to having a, a single device. And we are talking about uh, several hundred thousand devices here. So in the context of storage, uh, the, 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 the best known uh, techniques to cope with failures is replicating the data and then erasure coding. And probably most of you are already familiar with erasure coding, but for those of you who are not, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give a very short and simple summary of erasure coding and compare it with replication. Uh, let's say you have these uh, two pieces of data you want to safeguard against loss. And let, for simplicity, these are two integers we want to safeguard. Uh, in, in the replication case, you just make another copy of the data. Uh, and Obviously, it requires twice the, uh, the storage size of the original data. In the erasure coding case, in the, in the simple implementation, you have same set of the original data, but instead of making an exact replica of the data, you add a parity fragment, which is a linear dependency on the original data. And in the case of failure, let's say in either case we lost a single device. In the replication case, you can just go and uh, read from the replica device, and you have your data back. In the erasure coding case, you don't have the value of A directly available. Uh, so, but you have these two simple equations, where, and you can read the remaining surviving fragments and deduce the value of A from them uh, easily. So what happened here? In the replication case, you, you tolerate a single failure. 
uh, but it requires twice the size of the original data. In the Azure coding case, again, you tolerate a single failure, but it requires one and a half times the original data size, so you save some space. Uh, in addition, uh, in with erasure coding, if you if you can use same amount of space, if you don't care about the space, you can add more parity fragments, uh, and that will give you additional tolerance. And in this case, if if you add the second parity, the the code will tolerate any two random failures. So you you with erasure coding, you can uh, get space savings or improve improve durability. Um, Okay, if you go back to Windows Azure Storage, uh, uh, as you see on the right, on the figure on the right, uh, Azure Storage is deployed in in pairs of two clusters, uh, and the clusters are replicated in geographical across geographical uh, subregions. Inside a given cluster, uh, the 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 stream layer you see at the bottom there uh, provides the the in, the intra cluster replication and data durability. The stream layer is an append-only distributed file system. Each uh, stream uh, consists of extents, uh, which are our uh, unit of replication. We, we replicate extents across several machines and disk drives. Uh, when extents are around three gigabytes each, uh, we seal those extents, they become immutable. Uh, until they are sealed, uh, extents are triple replicated across three machines at least. Uh, when they are sealed, uh, we uh, erasure code the extent and uh, delete the original copies. So after sealing operation, you only have the erasure coded uh, pieces. And at this point, of course, you are going from triple replication to 1.5 erasure recording and save half of the space. Uh, this shows our uh, approach we used in our, uh, in, in our implementation in the standard erasure recording. Erasure recording has been around for almost 50 years and has been used in everything from space communication to DVDs to your the cell phone data transmission now. So uh, what we chose, read Solomon 6 plus 3, uh, we divide our extents into six data fragments, then generate three more parity fragments for durability. And all, all, all these nine pieces are distributed across uh, uh, several racks and devices uh, to make sure they don't fail at the same time. Uh, so when we implemented erasure coding, we have learned some lessons, and I'd like to share a couple of those with you. And the first one is uh, uh, the arithmetic required for erasure coding is, 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 a, is a difficult math area that's called a gallery of fields, and uh, it's directly using, trying to use those operations takes a lot of time. And there are well-known established techniques that transform all these Gallia field operations to XOR operations, and XORs are very fast in modern CPU architectures. That's one thing you have to do uh, when you implement erasure coding. And erasure coding also introduces a lot of new IO types. Uh, you're breaking data into pieces, distributing it, and, and some failures happen, you have to read lots of pieces and reconstruct the data. So you have to make sure that uh, all those new operations in the storage system uh, do not overwhelm the on-demand customer IOs. So you have to make sure the scheduling of IOs are pretty well prioritized and throttled. Uh, also, when Data is broken into pieces and distributed. You have to make sure you always have the data that you think you have. And to, and to do that, you have to add uh, checksums at every level of the operation and hand over and check checksums uh, between levels. And uh, I, I forgot to mention, and, and the data needs to be scrubbed periodically to make sure that you can always get the original data back. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, the, the system is doing all these erasure coding, doing recoveries in the background, all the while the customer data is asking for data. 
So you have to make sure that customer uh, uh, demand IO has always the priority and we can serve them always fast. Uh, and, and last but not the least, uh, when you distribute all these pieces, uh, you have to make sure each piece goes to an independent fault domain. So you don't want uh, your data pieces to fail at the same time. You, you want to place them in places where they won't uh, have uh, dependent or correlated failures. Also, we, do, uh, we always do rolling upgrades of our systems to improve software. So you have to make sure that we can access the pieces while doing the software upgrade. Uh, so that requires that you distribute the, 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 the Azure coding fragments across upgrade domains. Uh, so that during an upgrade, you always have access to pieces of your data in, enough to, to construct the original data. After we implemented the, the Read Solomon 6 plus 3 Azure coding, uh, we went from 3x replication down to 1.5x Azure coding, it gave us almost half of the space in system space back. Uh, but there are still uh, some triple replicated data indicated by the, the small uh, red piece there. Uh, and that is the data that is actively being appended, which is not sealed. Uh, those data is still replicated. And and uh, we have system policies to choose uh, to always use triple replication for some streams and uh, not. So uh, the system allows you to choose between triple replication or erasure coding for certain types of streams. Uh, so to summarize, uh, I talked about how we uh, take extents and erasure code them and generate 6 plus 3 and go down from 3x to 1.5 uh, X uh, storage usage. In the in the second part of the talk, um, Cheng will tell you how we can further reduce this storage requirement, storage space requirement, without uh, sacrificing durability or performance. So, thanks, Jose. Uh, let me start by saying that. Uh, um, uh, just the saving storage overhead for 50% is already very significant uh, given the So just the saving the storage overhead for 50% is very significant given the scale of the cloud, right? But that also imposes a very uh, intriguing question is that can we do better and uh, achieve substantial more savings? So in the next uh, half of the talk, I will be presenting a new scheme. And then before that, I will briefly review, so what do you would do if you're using standard approach to further reduce the uh, storage cost, right? Okay. So here is uh, how a standard approach would work. So we would take the, the sealed extent, and instead of dividing into six, we would divide it into 12 pieces, and then spread the 12 pieces to 12 distributed nodes. And then because you have more number of pieces, then the likelihood of encountering failures are higher, right? So then intuitively, if you just add three parities, that would then give you enough durability. So it turns out that you would need four pieces of parities. But in this case, the parity size is half of the original size. So it turns out that you end up saving spaces. So you go down from 1.5x to 1.33. So that's how you would apply a standard approach to reduce the storage cost. So this sounds good, but then there's a problem. So the problem happens that uh, when there's a read request comes for date D0, and then the storage node hosting D0 is unavailable. Right? For availability purpose, you need to serve this read request by reconstructing D0. And then in the case of uh, standard 12 plus uh, four codes, you would need to assemble 12 pieces of fragments to reconstruct D0. So that is 12 uh, disk IOs and then 12 network transfers. So compared to a 6 plus 3 scheme, so you actually doubled the cost of doing this reconstruction. Right? So, so people might ask that, uh, do we even need to care about this cost of reconstruction? 
uh, the answer is yes, because the reconstruction happens uh, frequently enough in the system that if you don't deal with them properly, they will cause a serious performance degradation. So here are a few concrete scenarios. So the first one is when storage node becomes hot, we avoid sending further reads to those nodes, and instead we serve those reads through reconstructions. The second case is in rolling upgrades, say you take 10% of the nodes down for upgrades, and the reads go through towards these nodes have to be through, uh, served through reconstruction. And then in addition, you have transient failures and the permanent failures, and the reads towards those devices have to be served through reconstruction. So it is very important to point out that uh, all these reconstructions happen during the critical path of serving read requests. So the cost of reconstruction would uh, directly affect uh, the user perceived performance. So that is the reason we really need to uh, care about that. Right. So we revealed two schemes, the six plus three, which gives us uh, okay uh, reconstruction cost, but then we didn't like the uh, storage cost, 1.5. The 12 plus four scheme, the storage cost is what we like, 1.33, but we did not like the reconstruction cost of 12. Right, so the question is, can we uh, design a scheme which give us the desirable storage cost and also acceptable reconstruction cost? And then so we all know that there's no free lunch, right? So there must be something that we are exploiting. So the key observation here is, if you apply conventional erasure coding, then all failures are treated equal. That means it doesn't matter you have one failure, two failures, three failures. It always takes 12 uh, fragments to reconstruct a single fragment. But we know that in cloud storage, all failures are not equal. Right? The probability of single failure are way higher than probability of two or more failures. So once you realize that, so the solution kind of comes out, right? So we could try to optimize erasure coding for cloud storage by making single failure reconstruction much more efficient. So with that, let me introduce our new code called local reconstruction codes. So what we do is we again take the sealed extent and then divide it into 12 data fragments. And we further divide the 12 fragments into two groups call them X group and Y group. So we compare, we compute one local parity, the green ones, for each local group. And then we compute two global parities for all the 12 fragments. So now you can see that we have 12 data fragments and we have four parity fragments. So the overhead is uh, uh, 16 over 12, 1.33 X, right? And then if you have a failure, let's say X zero not uh, available, and then to reconstruct X0, all you need to do is uh, to access all the remaining fragments in the X group and that green local parity. So the reconstruction cost becomes six, right? So, so with this, we actually achieve the storage uh, overhead we desire, and then the reconstruction cost is down to the six. And, but there's one more thing we need to take care is uh, does the LRC code give us enough reliability, right? So then translate into this specific case, it's 12 plus 2 plus 2. Uh, so we need to be able to tolerate arbitrary three failures, but just as we mentioned that 12 fragments tolerating three failures are not sufficient. So we actually, on top of that, we need to tolerate as many four failures as possible. Okay, so it turns out that uh, tolerating three failures are not that difficult. So here is a simple example. Say you have three failures uh, distributed among the 12 uh, data fragments. Right. They have two in the X group and one in the Y group. Then we can see that because there's only one uh, failure in the Y local group, then you can try to use the uh, Y local parity to reconstruct uh, Y1. And after that, you are down to two failures, and then you can use the two uh, global parities to uh, reconstruct X0 and X2. So, and then you can work out all the cases that should show that uh, all the fa three failure cases are indeed recoverable. So this is not that difficult. So what is a bit more challenging is uh, uh, for failure, uh, four failure cases. So here is an example of four failures. 
So you have four failures distributed among the data uh, fragments. And then this particular case, it's not immediately clear how you would proceed because none of the local groups will allow you to make progress. And then the paper has more details about how we actually can recover all the cases similar to that. Okay, so I will skip the details in here. But the bottom line is uh, we were able to design LRC so that it achieves a recovery limit and then translating into this specific setting the LRC 12 plus 2 plus 2 is able to recover arbitrary three failures and 86% of the four failures. And that gives us a, a reliability between 12 plus 4 scheme and then uh, 6 plus 3. So that is uh, durable enough for us. Okay. So there's one more point I'd like to mention is uh, uh, we actually had a separate study which showed that if you give us uh, the desirable uh, reconstruction cost and then desirable uh, fault tolerance. Uh, LRC constructs the minimum length code, so it means that you cannot do uh, codes with less storage requirement. So LRC is a flexible scheme. So basically there are a few knobs you can tune. So like how many data fragments you divide and how many local parities you add and how many global parities you add, right? So each set of parameters essentially give you one trade-off point in a three-dimensional space. So these three dimensions are storage overhead, reconstruction cost, and also uh, reliability, which we measured using mean time to data loss. And then you can choose any point to operate but in practice, that uh, reliability is uh, a hard requirement. It's something you cannot uh, sacrifice, right? So we typically uh, use uh, reliability of three replication as a reference. We say that we do not consider any scheme which is less reliable than three replication. And then that allows us to cut this three-dimensional space into 2D. And then we, we can uh, explore the spaces for LRC, and then we can explore the spaces for read Solomon codes and then compare them. And then here is a figure showing the comparison. So the x-axis is showing the storage overhead, and then the y-axis is showing the reconstruction cost. And then the two schemes we mentioned, the read Solomon 12 plus 4 and then 6 plus 3 are the two points on the red curve. So you can see that uh, in general, if you allow higher storage overhead, then you can reduce the reconstruction cost. But if you want to lower a storage overhead, that uh, boots up the reconstruction cost, right? And then actually practical systems, they choose points along this red curve. Uh, so we'd like to mention that uh, there's this scheme, uh, Reed Solomon 10 plus 4, which is used uh, by Facebook in HDFS rate. And then also uh, GFS2 is using uh, choice of Reed Solomon. But once we realize that LRC offers a, a better trade off curve than the red one, then we can actually try to move away from red curve and then to the blue curve, right? For example, if you start from uh, 6 plus 3, one choice is you say, I keep my storage overhead the same, but I switch to LRC 12 plus 4 plus 2, that will allow you to reduce reconstruction cost by half, right? Or alternatively, you say that I can afford the same reconstruction cost of six, then using an LRC code, 12 plus two plus two will allow you to reduce the storage overhead from 1.5 to 1.33. And then in practice, you can choose arbitrary points along uh, this blue curve. And in the end, uh, Windows Azure storage team says that uh, uh, we like to choose 14 plus 2 plus 2, which requires a slightly higher reconstruction cost, uh, 7 versus 6, but it gives us additional 14% of storage savings. So again, I'd like to remind you that given the scale of the cloud, 14% is a really significant number. Okay. So with that, uh, let me conclude. So in this presentation, uh, we described how Windows Azure Storage is using original coding uh, to achieve significant storage cost savings uh, with better reliability than three replication. 
and we presented a new erasure coding scheme called LRC, which achieves additional 14% savings without compromising performance. And I would strongly encourage people interested in all the exciting work in Windows Azure Storage to follow the team's blog. And with that, let me conclude, and then we can take questions. So you have one, two questions. Yael um, Melman from EMC. You led us to believe that you can recover from three failures when you had two failures in one group and one failure in the other group. But what happens if the three failures are in one group? Then you have a lot of cases with three failures that you do not recover. Yeah, so if you have three failures in the same group, you can still recover. So the paper actually has proofs that it works for all the three failure cases. It does, yeah. Hi, uh, Richard Elling with Day Storage Systems. Um, I can fully understand where you got to with this model if the failure mode you're considering is failed disk. However, the dominant failure mode I'm seeing is unrecoverable reads. How do you manage unrecoverable reads? So uh, let me try to understand. So uh, the failure model we're assuming is actually node failure, not disk failures. So uh, we, when we distribute ah. all the uh, chunks so, out. So it's a storage node failure. Yes. Ah, so we actually distribute across all the storage nodes. We never try to put any two fragments onto the same node. Uh, so like uh, Hossein was mentioning four domains. We have rack as a four domain and also node as a four domain. Never two things go to the same four domain. Hi, I guess it's a follow-up question then. Um, uh, in your case, how do you deal with unrecoverable read errors or uh, entire disk failures? Do you have uh, additional hardware RAID or something that's protecting you from those individual disk failures? Uh, sorry, you want to go ahead? When a disk or node fails, that uh, space is picked up by all the rest of the servers in the system. So you always have some percentage of the space left out on all the, all the remaining servers. So if there are like a thousand extends on a disk when it fails, like a thousand other replications are happening in the system to pick up that space. So do you guys find that it's easier to deal with a complete node failure as opposed to dealing with individual disk failures or read errors? Uh, is that, okay. Does that not make your uh, node failure more frequent? Okay, that, I'm, I'm sorry if there's a misunderstanding there. So we, if, if a disk fails, okay, we only replicate the, the, the missed data on the disk. Like we don't automatically fail the whole node. So, so your ground ladder your failure is a disk. Yeah, we handle disk failures Thank individually. You. Yes. Uh, hi, uh, you talked about uh, the construction uh, cost. But what about uh, the construction cost uh, when uh, you create uh, those parity blocks and remove replicas? Uh, what would be the cost of the bandwidth that we used for creating the, those replicas uh, 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 comparing with the saved disk space? Right, so uh, Hossein actually mentioned that all the encoding phase are done in the background, so you get the luxury to schedule them as you like. And also, so you start with the three replication, right? So you, you take one of extent. So you go to that node and then read all the data out. So there's no network transfer. Then you divide the data and then you generate parity, send them out. So that phase involves network traffic and disk uh, uh, read, uh, writes. But then that's all done in the background. So it's not on a critical path, right? So when data comes in, they go to three replication form. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks to Hussein. No, no. Thank you.